All right. Well, good afternoon, folks that are uh, in the uh, East uh, Coast time zone. Uh, good morning for those that are uh, elsewhere or in a uh, good evening. Uh, if you are over across the pond. We're super glad to have everybody here for our uh, one epic industry update. Um, so this will be a, a slightly different format, um, and, uh, but ultimately the, the core of talking with industry professionals and discussing um, what's going on is, is going to be uh, uh, throughout today's webinar. So we're super glad you're here. Uh, so one of the things that we'd like to encourage you to do, um, and, and we're open to any and all types of questions throughout today's webinar, is to submit those questions. So your participation in the webinar um, is vital. Um, so we actually uh, would would love to have you um, uh, participate. So in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, you'll probably see a little Q&A spot. Um, you can uh, click on that and you can type your question in and then that will go to um, us where we'll be able to address it as we're going through the conversation um, or bring it up with a specific panelist where it would be appropriate. So we want to encourage you to uh, please do that. Um, and I want to thank uh, Charlie uh, for being our first uh, question um, and, and welcoming, welcoming uh, everybody from Nashville. So again, please uh, feel free to, to participate in the question and answer. Um, if it's a, a topic that, that we're addressing, uh, feel free to drop a question in there. Or if there's something else that's on your mind that you wanted to, to get some opinions on, we'd, we'd happily entertain that as well. So thank you. I feel like Charlie did that because I'm from Nashville as well, and he just wanted to beat me to the punch. So hi, I, it, Charlie. From, hello from Nashville as well, everybody. It could be that I forgot to name his time zone, and that was also part of it. <laughs> um, so as I mentioned, we'll be going through an epic industry update. So uh, um, we're going to take kind of that, that exciting portion of each one of our webinars and really um, use our entire time with that. Um, so, to, you know, the, the agenda is going to be typical to our, our discussions like this. We'll be uh, together for about 90 minutes. Um, and really, this is a, a community discussion. We're going to be presenting what, some of what we see are some best practices happening um, out in the industry. Um, and we're really going to be thriving off of the questions that, that you have um, and ways to um, share even more. Um, there is, uh, if there's anybody from the press that's joining us, we want to welcome you. If you don't mind just introducing yourself in the question and answer, uh, we'd appreciate that as well. Uh, if this is your first Wednesday uh, webinar, uh, you may be wondering what this is. And it's really just a bi-weekly gathering of attraction industry experts um, where we talk about what are the current challenges and, and how do we position our attractions for success. Uh, so if you're wondering kind of what we've talked about in the past, that's kind of what you're seeing there on the screen. Um, it's really, we're focusing on, you know, that guest experience, that employee experience, and driving the financial results that we need to satisfy the missions of our attractions. So super glad that you're he, um, able to join us. And one of the things I want to uh, recommend that you uh, bookmark or visit as often as you can is gatewayticketing.com slash community. Um, this is where you'll find um, ways that you can engage with uh, these webinars in the future. Um, right now, we don't have our August 5th webinar up there, but we will have it shortly. But you can always come here and check out uh, kind of what's going on in the community and ways that um, you can be involved with us um, at Gateway. With all that out of the way, I'd love to introduce myself. I'm Matthew Hohenstein. I am our principal for uh, destinations. Uh, and so I work with a lot of uh, attractions that are uh, trying to solve business problems in innovative ways. My colleague is uh, Randy Jocelyn, who is uh, really leading that from a, a wildlife and conservation standpoint and with other large attractions. Randy? Hey, thank you, Matthew. Happy to be here, everybody. Um, as always, we are delighted to be here in, um, and sharing some thoughts and ideas with you. And um, we couldn't do this program without some great panelists. And we have uh, one of the greatest panelists uh, joining us today. Uh, Bernard Donahue is joining us from ALVA. Um, ALVA is the Association of uh, Leading Visitor Attractions in the UK. And Bernard has uh, a plethora of great titles and roles and positions. And, and he's gonna really give us some great insight about what's happening across the pond. Uh, what we're seeing there as as museums reopen, as attractions reopen in the UK. So we're really delighted to have him uh, joining us today. Um, today's uh, format's a little different. It's going to be more of like a, we're all sitting on the couch having conversations. There's going to be a lot more questions and answers within us. 
um, because we only have three panelists today, uh, plus our, our host, Bill D'Angelo. So Bill might jump in, Greg Banneker, our marketing director is here as well. Um, and we're really gonna rely on you guys today to answer some questions. So keep questions moving in the chat, but we're really gonna kind of do a big broad industry update today. Like as we mentioned, one epic industry update. So really no topic is, um, um, is too small to talk about. We're gonna talk about trash cans. <laughs> and I know we're gonna talk about big policies about reopening um, you know, with reservations and, and queuing and whatnot. So we're gonna be kind of talking the gamut. So um, let us get going today. Um, we're gonna start with an industry update, something that is, um, it actually is, it's, it's really not an industry update. It's more like a COVID update. Um, I, as you guys had seen here, I'm here in Nashville and uh, things have changed. Um, you know, uh, in my community, uh, we're starting to get some daily numbers of COVID at, that are getting very alarming um, throughout the South. And I think Matthew can probably share uh, being in Orlando, he's probably feeling the same things, right? He turns on the, well, I don't know if anybody turns on the TV anymore. I just turn on the news on my on my mobile devices, but it just seems like there's some kind of crazy news all the time. One of the things that personally I wanted to share about was um, there's there's a tremendous need for for blood, and you guys are probably aware of this. There's a blood shortage, but there's also a very um, large need to like under to get tested for COVID. Um, questions in my household that are floating around is like, you know, I was sick, but I'm reading all these people that have tested positive and they were asymptomatic. Did I have COVID? Um, I just wanted to share with everybody that um, this is actually a, a really great solution to give and help out um, the communities that need blood, but also to understand what your antibody status is. So um, this is really just a public service announcement to say, if you're, if you're able to give blood, um, please uh, go to this website, put in your zip code, and then one of the great benefits is you'll be giving blood, but they'll also let you know what your antibody status is. Uh, I, I believe it's within a few days on the app. Um, you'll get a positive, a negative, or an, an unknown, but at least it's some good information. So a um, little PSA, I just want to let everybody know it's something to consider um, maybe reaching out and, and donating. All right. so. Uh, let's talk about reopenings. Um, although uh, some places are, are not open and some places have, have closed, there's some really great news. Um, you know, the Field Museum in, in Chicago, it's, they're reopening, uh, I believe it's this Friday for this weekend. Like all attractions and museums, they're observing um, the mandatory face coverings. Uh, reservations are required. Uh, certain exhibit halls are closed. But I did notice a trend. I was starting to go through a lot of the museums that are opening up, and many of them are really large museums and have lots of grandiose space. And so that feeling of safety and comfort, um, can, many museums can meet you in that area where you, can, you feel like you have enough space and you can go and visit. I've been watching a lot of um, blogs and vlogs and video showcases of attraction visitors and it seems, you know, everybody um, is feeling pretty comfortable in the wide open spaces or in the large spaces. And it's really when you kind of get into a tight hall that you start to get this really uncomfortable feeling and maybe you might not choose to go there. Um, there's a, a vlogger I like to watch, his name's Tim Tracker, and he, um, he won't go on indoor attractions right now. He's just saying, hey, I just wanna stay out for a little bit. Um, you know, that's kind of his sentiment. So I am noticing, though, that the places are reopening. There's some characteristics about them that makes them more able to be open, and um, it's good news uh, there for the, the Field Museum. Um, some other friends of ours that have reopened, I, I also want to point out a few things that I think is just novel and interesting. Uh, the Boston Children's Museum, they've, I love this, welcome back, we're playing safely. Um, really great, you know, marketing spin here. Um, We've got a little girl in her in her Supergirl outfit here, and uh, and, a, and a Wonder Woman outfit, which is quite funny because uh, right before we started, my my youngest daughter was running around in a Wonder Woman outfit. Um, so it's it's apparently kids are getting anxious to play, and you know going to the Boston Children's Museum is a great location to play. Uh, one thing I do want to call attention to, um, I want to talk a little bit about reservations, and this is really just a a, a quick update. Um, they're 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 using two flights. We talked about this about ten or eleven um, weeks ago, or webinars ago. This concept that um, we're going to bring people in safely at comfortable levels, 
Uh, what I really like that they're doing at that museum is um, they, they, they're closed for this period of time in the middle of the day. I'm not sure if it's to sanitize and clean or what is happening or if it's just to give people some of a, a break as you bring new groups of people in. Um, but that's uh, a model that we're starting to see at some of these attractions that they're, they're bringing in groups and smaller groups across different time periods. The other thing that's also of note here is um, the blue shading, I, I believe, on the calendar there. That just represents days that they're not open. Um, they've made a decision to not open Monday and Tuesday, and um, instead they've just uh, um, kind of left that off, and maybe it's a, it's a time for their staff to engage in other activities, or maybe uh, the staff is just working five days a week, you know, Wednesday through Sunday, the full-time staff. But anyway, it's, it's interesting to note some, some changes in how uh, businesses are operating. Yeah, Randy, I, I think I've seen that with a, a couple other attractions in that, you know, it, it, I think really during this time, the idea is how do we operate as efficiently and financially fiscally responsible as possible. Um, so at times where, you know, we're starting the ramp up and we're starting to get more attendance, we probably do want to be very conservative with, with maybe our initial operating calendars and, and um, making sure that's matching the income that we're coming in. So having maybe just one staff um, and, uh, and not you know, needing two staffs to cover a seven day a week operation. Um, while it's not where we wanna be, um, it may be where we have to be at this time um, until we, can, we get back to uh, more of the visitation patterns that we're used to. Yeah, that's a great point, Matthew. I mean, profitability is really something that, you know, we're gonna to touch on it probably later in this, in this conversation uh, today, but yeah, I mean, you have to look at your profitability. In fact, we have a webinar in the future that we, we haven't scheduled it because we're, we actually are often changing our webinars. Um, we had originally planned on a different topic uh, for today. Uh, so we do have a good idea of what we wanna talk about. And unfortunately, as we're monitoring, you know, what's current, we've kind of pivoted. But one of the conversations that we will have in the future is, um, you know, especially as you go into your Q4 budget, period, um, you're going to have to look at your profitability. And a lot of nonprofits have some great, great experiences, and they have some great offerings that unfortunately might, might not be making the cut, you know, in 2021, just because it's, it's maybe not the most profitable um, experience for the, for the institution. So uh, we will have a, a deep dive presentation about that in, in the upcoming weeks. Um, Bernard, you know, I, I, I want to ask you, um, I mean, I'm, I'm already switching gears, but something that Matthew brought up, I'm curious, in the UK, are, are you guys seeing like changes to operating schedules like this as places have reopened? Have they really tweaked their operating calendar so they might be closed on days they hadn't been closed traditionally or on hours, or have they extended their hours in other instances? Yes, there's a, there's a couple of things that have happened. I mean, one is, of course, they're all operating at reduced capacity. So typically they're operating at about 30% of the number of people who would typically come on that day the previous year. So great, much reduced capacity. Oddly, however, I've been to a number of our members here in central London, like the National Gallery and St. Paul's Cathedral. Uh, actually, the visitor experience as a result of that is enhanced because you can get to see stuff. Uh, and it feels like one of those classic VIP behind the scenes tours experiences that money can't buy, yet yeah, funnily enough it can. Um, and so actually the visitor experience is enhanced. So that's one of the things that we're hearing back from visitors. Uh, the second is that uh, you're right. I mean, uh, our attractions are just tweaking their opening hours. So uh, of course you have to book a time slot in advance uh, via the website. So one of the things that they're doing is, is perhaps putting on more evening activities, um, perhaps opening a little later in the morning. And that's to, in order to ensure that their staff can get to, the public, uh, get to the attractions via public transport and that they're not going at busy times on public transport because of you know, pandemic reasons. So uh, if, if ever there was an opportunity to tweak things, change things, test things, this is it. Uh, and lots of our members are are doing just that at the moment. That's a great point of really taking this opportunity to reimagine things. It's it's unfortunate that we we're 
forced to do it, um, but it's it's a great opportunity to to think differently. Yeah, and I didn't even think of like the uh, the transportation guidelines, but obviously it makes sense. You know, uh, adjusting your hours and and maybe traditionally, and that we go back to that profitability position. A lot of attractions like to have that early morning offering, that eight or nine or whatnot in the morning uh, for a select audience. Uh, it could be for you know uh, moms in the and the carriages. It could be for you know m maybe some of your more senior uh, guests. But that might be uh, a time period where you look at your profitability, you look at your numbers during that time, and you might make make some adjustments. And maybe you only offer that early morning experience on a set day of the week. Um, instead of every day, because an hour here or two hours here is really going to help your bottom line as you as you move into um, recovery, because that's where everyone's in. They're in a recovery mode and they're trying to recapture that lost revenue. Um, well, good information. Thanks. Um, along those lines about reservations, uh, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I think it's always interesting to see more. Um, Space Center Houston has reopened. This is a great, great uh, museum. If you have not had an opportunity, if you're in the Texas area, please check out Space Center Houston. It's a it's a great location just uh, next to Johnson Space Center. Uh, so that they have many many uh, original uh, artifacts and, and uh, vehicles and and other uh, elements from the space program. Um, they've just reopened. A great friend of mine uh, has um, her name's Mary, and Mary Mary took the job as the new COO. I, I believe it was probably like. I want to say like March 15th, like literally it was like right when the pandemic was was hitting and she had to uh, work on reopening this uh, great location really remotely before being able to uh, connect with her staff uh, on a constant basis uh, in person. One of the things that struck me here, um, and I think we're starting to hear more about this, but I'm going to zoom in on some of their reopening procedures. Um, clearly, they've done a lot of the things we've been hearing about, uh, limited capacity, uh, time tickets, staggered entry. They're actually doing uh, hourly admissions. So if you go to the website, you can just book by hour. So they brought everybody into an, an hour visit. Uh, everything's one directional flow, plexiglasses, touch. They have these new touchless uh, turnstiles they were able to install and um, get up and running prior to reopening, which is, which is really great. Um, but something about uh, that I noticed here was that um, the, the face coverings, so they're requiring face coverings for two years old and over and for all staff, of course. And um, I had previously been seeing lots of locations of face coverings, and I, I would love to hear uh, anybody in the community mention this as well, but um, some locations uh, give you grace if you are not able to wear a face covering for some type of medical reason. Uh, but the policy here at uh, Space Center Houston is if you cannot wear the mask and you are over age two, then they're kindly asking you to, to come visit on, on another day. Um, so, uh, Matthew, you were mentioning, we, we were talking a little bit, that's happening in some Orlando areas as well. Yeah, and, and I think we'll get into that a little bit more detail um, coming up. And, and, and I think that we're starting to see a shift in kind of um, masks in the United States. Um, and, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about what some of the things that, that have uh, recently happened. Yeah, cool. We'll make sure to talk about that. Um, so if you have any questions about masks or you want to give some insight, let us know in the chat as well. Uh, the spy, the International Spy Museum is a great location, great big building that, that re actually moved and reopened this year and then unfortunately had to close down. Um, also, I just like some of uh, the, they've got some nice press out of their safe and stealthy campaign, a nice marketing uh, ploy there. Um, they're actually bringing everybody in on 15 minute increments. And this is a, a screenshot. I just made this morning for tomorrow, and you could see, you know, that they've they've got, you know, I don't know how many people they're bringing per time slot, but it looks like they've got four and left and six and and some of these other times. Uh, also, a good indicator that maybe that nine to ten a.m. is not the most popular time to visit. They're also using a stylus um, as well for their interactives. It's a heavily interactive museum. And um, I believe that uh, the World War II Museum had mentioned on our webinars uh, months ago that they're reopening, they use styluses that they're giving away. And it's good to, to hear and see that uh, a different location is employing the same, um, the same, the same offering. Um, hey, Matthew, what's, what's, what's this jump in the face coverings? If, if, let me jump over here to this slide. 
um, because I would like you to share a little bit more of what, what you're hearing in Orlando. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we've seen slight tweaks from some of the large attractions um, since they reopened it, around the requirements for masks. Uh, for example, attractions like Walt Disney World and Universal Orlando um, have now limited um, the types of masks or face coverings that are allowed. Uh, so, for example, I think Walt Disney World now prohibits the, the gator, um, I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, uh, style of face covering. Um, and then they've also provided some additional guidance on when, they, when face uh, covering should be used. Uh, this is really coming as attractions in America are specifically and specifically in areas like Florida are working in a really turbulent environment. You know, right on one hand, we have this vital need for these attractions to be open to contribute to the local economy. Um, both Universal Orlando and Walt Disney World together employ more than 100,000 individuals uh, prior to the pandemic. Um, the additional sales and hotel tax that those attractions bring in is vital to the state of Florida's income and being able to, to be solvent as a state. You know, during Orlando's peak periods of visitation, we generally see hotel occupancy that's around 90%. We were excited um, on July 4th, Visit Orlando shared um, that occupancy peaked at 39.7%. Um, so this is really, you know, as it's affected the world over, um, it, it's, it's very um, impactful on an area like, like uh, Florida. Um, you know, so, so again, these, these masks um, play such a vital role in this because, you know, uh, one of the things that, that the attractions in Florida are having to balance is that in Florida, we've seen um, 155,000 new cases just in the past two weeks. Um, obviously, South Florida is an area that's, that's highly impacted by that, but Central Florida is, is not unaffected. Um, positivity has been in the range of about 13%. So what I think we're seeing with these attractions is focusing on what they can control, right? They cannot obviously cure coronavirus. I, I'm certain if they could, that that would be the action that they could take. But what they can control is trying to make sure that the environment that people are in is a safe and as secure as possible. And I think that's something that, you know, we've, we've always been done. And I think we've, we've talked about it on prior webinars is that as an industry is what uh, we are, are really good with. Um, so while it may be uh, appearing that they're overly prescriptive in the behaviors that are allowed um, in the park, it's really vital to ensuring that they can um, attempt to create that safest environment as possible uh, during that time. I think uh, one of the, 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 the things that we also saw, Randy, if you want to um, move to the next slide, was um, some of the research that Visit Orlando had um, done. Um, so Visit Orlando, if you're not familiar, is a, basically a marketing agency that's focused on promoting um, the Central Florida area. And uh, they recently conducted research that's indicating that masks are, are very important to travelers right now that are considering destinations to visit. So um, if, if the destination I'm thinking about going is requiring masks and doing things like that, then, then that kind of makes it in, in the area where I might want to be. Um, so that coupled with additional focus now at, at a national level in the United States on, on mask usage, um, hopefully is, is going to start to change the, the polarization that I think we've seen up until this point of, uh, of masks. Uh, Randy, I'd love to know your, your perspective on this. I mean, do you think that it's our responsibility as attraction operators to control the guest experience uh, inside our parks at, at this level of, of uh, guest behavior? Um, you know, yeah, actually, I, I do. Um, I, I realize it's a really polarizing issue uh, about wearing a mask when you're out in the public. But at a theme park and an attraction where, you know, safety has always been our, our, our number one covenant in our industry, like keeping the guests safe, having safe family fun. If you go and look at mission statements across our industry, you're going to see the word safety as the number one a tenant, and I, I look at it the same way. I, I think it's like um, you know, you you have to wear shoes on certain rides and attractions, or you have, I mean, a real you know, keep your arms and legs and don't stand up on a ride. I, I actually kind of think it's the same thing. Uh, the attraction needs to keep you safe. They need to keep all the guests safe for the safety of everybody. And I don't I don't see how it's any different. It's certainly in their right to to have a requirement in, in the U.S. at least to um, enforce mask rules um, where possible. 
I mean, Randy, I, the one thing I, I think is, you know, as, as a, a general uh, attraction that wants to welcome everyone in, there's, there's also been some situations where, you know, the, the mask requirement is, has become a barrier for, for some very sensitive populations. And, um, you know, I, I think we saw um, recently on social media a park that, that unfortunately had, had to deny an entry to um, an autistic child um, because they couldn't wear a mask and, and they couldn't use a, um, a face shield. And, and there was no way um, for that park to help keep them safe in it. Um, and so I think that these are, are really tough situations, but, but again, I think, you know, uh, focusing on that safety and, and, and that's, that's what's paramount um, in, in our attractions is really key. Yeah, and Matthew, I'd say just it's an area where you just have to be overly communicative. You have to really communicate exactly what your position is. Um, you know, as an example, um, Leslie was asking about a gator mask. I, uh, I adjusted the slides, kind of slides on the go here. And, and this is, is an example of what I think Disney World is not allowing. And it's, it doesn't have, um, you know, loops for your ears. It, there's, it can fall down quite easily. Um, it doesn't adhere uh, underneath your chin. There's certain requirements, and um, it looks like Cherry from Brevard Zoo in Florida is saying in the chat that they had to update their language to specifically state no mesh or, or, or crocheted mask. You know, it's like so they have to tell everybody like these are the types of materials you have to employ. I am starting to see. I, I'm looking for mine. I usually have my mask right around me. I have a mask that has a, a valve, you know, an exhaust, like I was going to say an exhaust valve. It's a filter valve. And we're having to then further clarify, you know, what masks, you know, are allowed. You know, I'm a spe I have a special needs child and my daughter, um, uh, you know, she has Down syndrome. She does not keep a mask on, you know, so I have to know in advance, like, where am I going? And, um, you know, what are the expectations? Because if the expectation is that she has to wear a mask, I, I, just, I just have to choose not to go um, because she, can't, she cannot comply with that. Um, you know, Bernard, in uh, the UK, mask rules are, are changing. And can you give us an update of, of what you're seeing? And have you gone to the extent where they're having to define what a mask is at attractions? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. So uh, I, I went down to the south coast uh, of England uh, yesterday and uh, I took a I took a bus to uh, the mainline train station. I then went on a train uh, I then went on another bus and then I went on a ferry. So I was wearing a face mask for about three and a half hours. Uh, and that's because it's mandatory to wear a mask on all forms of public transport. That hasn't changed at all. Um, as from this weekend, it's now mandatory to wear a face mask, uh, and that also includes a, a clear Perspex visor, by the way. It's also mandatory to wear a face mask inside shops. So that affects retail uh, outlets and, and stores within visitor attractions. So we're just uh, getting some guidance out of government and, and uh, the medical agency, Public Health England, as to what the implications are. But I have to say that... Um, particularly inside, inside buildings and inside shops, actually it's been the norm to wear face masks right from the outset. So there's been very little pushback. I mean, you know, and, and viewers will know that uh, normally in normal circumstances, people present the best version of themselves when they come to visitor attractions. You know, they've paid a lot of money. They want to have a nice time. They want to behave. They want to do the right thing. And, and so we're seeing very little pushback from members of the public uh, about face mask usage. Um, uh, two, two other things, if I, if I may. One is, um, uh, one of the things that we've also seen is, is legislative clarification around face masks. So the mandatory requirement to wear a face mask it, it is clear, but it's not superseded by, uh, sorry, it is superseded by anti-discrimination legislation. So our equivalent of the Americans with Disabilities Act is preeminent above the use of face masks. So if you have a good reason, a medical reason, not to use a face mask, uh, you cannot be discriminated against. You, you should be allowed into the visitor attraction if, if that's the reason, so you can't be discriminated. Um, while you were talking uh, about what we've been seeing in the UK, we've been doing visitor sentiment research right the way from the start of the pandemic. 
Uh, what are the things that reassure members of the public when they when they eventually go back to visitor attractions? What would deter them? What would scare them? What would encourage them? What would reassure them? Number one, and again, you'll uh, you'll appreciate this working in the visitor attractions world. Uh, number one, you've got to have toilets. Your toilets have got to be open. That's the number one requirement. 61% of people here in the UK have said, if your toilets aren't, aren't open, we're not coming. But the second point is, we want to see physical distancing being managed and policed, bad verb, but being policed by front of house staff. So they, they want to see it actually, actually being uh, controlled and managed by front of house staff. But the third thing, and this I suspect may chime with you, is that members of the public here in the UK have complete faith in front of house staff at attractions, doing the right thing, wearing the right thing, behaving in the right way. They've got very little faith in their fellow members of the public doing any of those things. So it really is consumer confidence is about the other guy, not about you. And, and so we're really seeing that on a daily basis here in the UK. Wow, that's that, that's some great information. I I, I do. I mean, I, I hate to bring it up again. It was a word I had said, and I I'm gonna say it, you know, lightly. I guess is we mentioned covidiots a, a while ago, which is you know just that that idiot that is invading your space and and, and is getting in your face and. Um, that was a big concern that many attractions had is like they can they can do a great job of enforcing the rules and the guidelines as you come in and they could remind staff i mean they can remind guests but you know you you, you cannot guarantee the behavior of the other person yeah um, but like you know, said attractions well, have always you know reserved the right to uh ban idiots uh and and to throw out uh, people who are not compliant with health, health and safety legislation, uh, and we still retain that right now. If, if you think you're uh, an exempted person, or you think you, you've got some sort of, you know, God-given right to prefer a ventilator than a face mask, you're just not going to be let in. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I, wa I wanted to pull this up. I'm, I kind of go, we kind of bounce around. I want to um, Sherry was asking. Actually, was it? It was Dominique. Dominique, you asked, um, "Has any? Have you heard of any attraction that has staff wearing masks to help people that are hard of hearing?" And, and here's an article. And, and we've mentioned this before that some, some. Um, I, I've even I've heard this at a couple major theme parks that there are staff members that might be, um, you know, they might speak um, American Sign Language or whatnot. So like key key um, employees that are assisting guests with um, hard of hearing might have masks like this. Um, my, da my daughter um, at her school, um, the staff is actually getting these types of masks to interact as school reopens because certain kids have those types of special needs where they need to see the expressions of their, of their teachers. And hey, Randy, this is, oh, this is just Greg chiming in. Um, I, my daughter actually is hard of hearing, and another thing that's very helpful for, for the hard of hearing and deaf community is the face shield that holds the face masks. They're not always very, it's not always feasible to get face shields for all staff, and it's not always feasible for the public to have a face shield to walk into an attraction. But if it is something you want to be very considerate of, the shields are very helpful. G great point, exactly where I was going, Greg. Um, and then also, Sheree, I think, uh, brought up a, a question about whether or not we're seeing uh, varying minimum age requirements. And I will say yes, uh, Sherry, uh, we, we certainly are. Um, again, you know, just a very small sample. Um, if we take two of the large parks here in Orlando, uh, we've got Walt Disney World that's clearly indicating that, hey, age two um, and under uh, does not need uh, face uh, coverings versus Universal Orlando is communicating, you know, everyone needs to have face covering. Um, now that's that's what they're, you know, publicly communicating. There may be exceptions or differences that, that they're dealing with internally. Um, but I think that um, we are going to continue to see some differences there. I don't, um, um, I would recommend kind of turning to the, the Center for Disease Control for the, the clearance guidance, clearest 
guidance on that. Um, I know obviously a, a lot of the schools that are, are preparing to reopen are kind of debating that at the moment as well. And I think that we probably would, would lean toward, towards them or the CDC for, um, you know, if, if I were operating the attraction and what I would want to do. And it's a great point. So, um, Randy, Actually, one of the other things, oh, yeah. Sorry, Matthew, I wanted to chime in one more time. So we had uh, a few weeks back, we talked to the National World War II Museum. And one thing that was very evident for them was, who do you have at the gate um, enforcing these rules? So you don't want to, uh, Bernard, you had said police, and you had even mentioned that might be the wrong, the wrong verb. You don't want to necessarily police it even when it, it happens to be law. So in their scenario, when they reopened back on May 6th, I think it was, or June 6th, um, it was not law in New Orleans to wear a mask, but it, the, the museum was requiring it. So they had people at the front gate who were very personable, who were very adept at making sure that people knew, you know, why they had to wear masks, uh, yet the reasoning why, and did it in a manner that didn't offend anyone and did it in a manner that, um, took them from being on guard to off guard. So uh, they even went so far as to script what one of their greeters did to get people to wear masks so that other people could replicate it because it was so effective. So definitely be cognizant of who you have staffing uh, your front gate, be even more selective than you may normally be. That, that's, a, that's a really good point. And that's certainly what we've seen here in the UK. Um, prior to all of the visitor attractions opening up and, and still a good 40% haven't opened up yet, because it's just not economically viable to do so. But before they opened up, one of the webinars and training programs that we did was to think about the expectations of your front of house staff. And I have to say the vast majority of front of house staff at visitor attractions in the UK, whether it's museums, galleries, uh, cathedrals, zoos, safari parks, are wearing those clear perspex visors in order to a smile, because you know the welcome of a smile after four months of lockdown madness is, is really important, uh, but also in order to, for people to be able to, to lip read if, if, if that's required. But one of the things that we have been uh, very clear about is that your front of house staff who have been traditionally trained in order to be that welcoming face uh, of, of you know, welcome and engagement and delight now has a, a more serious role, if you like, which is, which is about health and safety. Uh, and therefore, that you have to put a lot of thought into the training requirements and, and provide scripts uh, in order for them to feel confident enough to go up to people and either say you need to maintain your physical distancing uh, apart from each other or you need to wear face masks. And that's a, that's a different job than we've asked front of house staff people to do before. So uh, that, that has been an issue, but luckily so far, most people are rising to that challenge uh, very well and very successfully. Great point, uh, Bernard. Uh, Bridget, I wanna, uh, Bridget from the uh, Hershey Foundation um, shared a, a, a good point of a, an app that, um, that folks have been able to use, which is called Live Transcribe. Um, and that's a great app for hard of hearing. So um, she shared that her front desk is using that for folks that can't hear the employee. Um, and, and it's a, a, an easy way to kind of um, help in, in those situations where uh, lip reading maybe is not available because of the need for uh, a mask. So thank you. Yeah, and I, I don't, I'm not sure if it's an Android only app, but I, did, I threw it up here on the screen um, because it's, it's definitely interesting to hear about. That's great. Um, that's great. I, we're jumping all over the place, but Matthew, this is really, really great information. I, I really yeah. want to share. So um, in, in Orange County, Florida, um, they had a coronavirus update on, on Monday with the mayor and Orange County health officer, uh, Dr. Raul Pino was um, asked a question by a member of the Associated Press and specifically it was whether or not any of the COVID-19, uh, if there had been any COVID-19 outbreaks that have been traced back to um, any of the Central Florida theme parks. Um, the, the good news was that Dr. Pino shared that while obviously there's, there's been isolated situations um, where a, a member of, you know, maybe an attraction staff has uh, been diagnosed as positive, uh, there have not been any large um, spreading events where that, that have tags back to um, the theme parks. Um, so it was really, you know, great for me to hear that positive news. I think that that was one of the things that, that was um, concerning um, when, when we started to have these larger gatherings um, in, in my area. 
uh, when I look back at the work that attractions around the globe that have done in the, in the mere weeks that they had to get prepared for this, that radically transformed their experiences um, to further increase the, the safety and security of, of individuals in the moments like this, this is an example of, of that investment paying off, um, certainly. And, you know, th throughout our industry, the, I, I'm seeing that the focus on safety and security is consistent across all attractions. Um, however, you know, through media, I'm, I'm seeing other industries um, where you have some rogue players or, or some, some certain businesses that, that maybe aren't um, being consistent with, with their, their brethren and sisters um, in, in the industry. Uh, Bernard, uh, you work with a lot of attractions um, in, in, in coming together on things, and, and I was wondering what you thought um, was unique about our industry or, or maybe unique about attractions as well in the UK um, that helps knit um, uh, our, our, us together in this way. Oh, good question. I, I think there are a number of things. Um, the first is uh, certainly here in the UK, you occasionally hear the phrase, we're all in this together from politicians. And you know damn well we're not. Mm. Um, <laughs> there are some people who are doing well in crises and some people who are not doing well at all. Um, but, but I think the, the issue about attractions is um, that we, we have a common sense of values and purpose and that we want to give our customers and our visitors the best possible time. I often, I often refer to the fact that um, people who work in visitor attractions create the backdrops for people's happiest memories. Uh, slightly poetic, but um, not only is that a huge responsibility, but it's also a great opportunity as well. So one of the things that's been really heartening here in the UK, certainly, and I know from across the world, is that people who work in visitor attractions have uh, shared information and insights and data and research very openly, very freely. Uh, here in the UK, we have commissioned um, reams of data analysis, visitor sentiment research that we've shared with everybody in the sector, not just our members. Uh, and that's typical, I think, of the approach of lots of people in uh, not just visitor attractions, but in the wider cultural sector as well, that, that we all feel that we're part of a very fragile, interdependent ecosystem. And if, you know, we're all dependent on the, the pipelines and the funnels and the uh, procurement processes. And if, if any of those snap or if any of those are lost, we all suffer consequently. So um, one of the things, as I say, has been very heartening during the whole of this process to see people really share and, and the diminu diminution of, of ego. I mean, it hasn't entirely gone away in some organizations, but, but um, people really wanting to step up and to, to share as much as possible. And that, that's been great. I'm sure it's the case in the US as well. Yeah, I, I think that there's obviously a time and place for competition, right? Maybe it's the, the newest uh, uh, ride or, or the, the, the experience, um, but I've been really, really proud of our industry in a time like this where, where those, those barriers have come down and we've really worked together because I think we are so dependent on each other. Um, if one of us has, has a failing, it, it, it rubs off very easily on me, right? So um, I think that that's been great and I look forward to that to continue. This is also one of those times where, <clears throat> whether personally or corporately, you remember which organizations behaved well and did the right thing, but you also remember those organizations that didn't. Uh, and and that, that absolutely goes to the heart of your corporate reputation uh, and brand. So, you know, always being on the right side of history is a good place to be. Very true. Thank you. Bernard, I, I actually I want to I want to stay and talk a little bit more about the UK and and um, and kind of what's happening across the pond and, and and lessons that we can learn. I mean, in, first of all, you have an amazing storied career. I mean, somebody just can look you up, but I mean, you serve uh, as the mayor's of London's ambassador for cultural tourism, and you know you you've been in this field for for decades. Um, we've never seen anything quite like this. I mean, I'm sure you would absolutely agree um your your words even i wrote them all down i you know I, I love this industry because of everything you just said you know that we we have a common sense and common shared values of values and purposes and whatnot 
And I, I do like some of some of the things that I'm seeing out of the UK as attractions reopen. Um, July 4th was, was a pretty big kind of day. That seemed to be a day when most of the attractions began the reopening process um, from what I've seen. And in the last three plus weeks, we've continued to see more openings. Is there any like key lessons learned um, that you feel that uh, you, that the UK has done things exceptionally well that we could learn in the US for an attraction that hasn't yet to open? Uh, yeah, and I, I should preface that by saying um, wh one of the greatest things has been that we, we've been putting um, on weekly webinars now for, gosh, 16, 17 weeks uh, hosted by Gateway Ticketing. And they've been absolutely invaluable, uh, not just to interactions uh, here in the UK, where we've been able to share best practice from those attractions which have already opened, but also to understand each other's insights and, and where we've gone wrong as well as where we've gone right. So, so thank you very much. Um, here's a, here's a, a, a rough assemblage of things that we've learned. So number one is the toilet thing. Uh, mm. If you don't have toilets, just don't open because that <laughs> is the number one thing. Uh, secondly, um, people, have been pent up. There's a pent up desire to go to visitor attractions. People have been in lockdown for three and a half months. And although visitor attractions have been physically closed, they've been digitally open. So one of the things that we've also seen is real creativity on the part of museums and galleries in particular, but also zoos and safari parks and theme parks about making sure that their offering is digitally accessible. So uh, one of the things that we've seen here in the UK is um, the huge popularity of virtual tools of galleries and museums, uh, downloadable jigsaw puzzles. If I, by the way, if I'd have put my money into anything, it would have been into the hiring toilets and into the manufacture of jigsaws. I would have made a fortune over the course of the last four months. Um, downloadable recipes, uh, top tips for gardening, all of these kind of things coming out of attractions. So that digital innovation has been one thing. Uh, second thing is that when people have come back, when visitors have come back, it's often been a very, very emotional experience for them. Uh, they're going back to places that they've dreamt about, often literally dreamt about for the last four and a half months that are really special to them. It's where they've had first dates or gone with children, or it may well be the place that they're meeting up with their grandparents and their grandkids for the first time, an intergenerational uh, uh, tourist visit. So the very fact of going to a special place is becoming enormously emotional, so be prepared for that. Mm. It's also emotional for staff as well, particularly for those staff who've been furloughed or, or who haven't been working. So uh, they've been physically distanced from the places, the collections that they love, that they have a real emotional um, attachment to, but also their colleagues as well, who they may not love necessarily, but they certainly like and they miss. Uh, and so coming back to, for them, if they're able to, has been a, a hugely emotional experience too, so don't underestimate that. A mm. third thing, and this is peculiar to visitor attractions, is that We've seen a massive no-show rate from members and friends of attractions. So these are not paying visitors. These are people who've already paid their membership for the year or, or are a friend for the year. And they're booking multiple slots during the course of a week to, to guarantee themselves access, not having to pay for it, and then not turning up uh, because they're just getting into the cycle, the, the mentality, if you like, of booking in a way that they've never had to before. So there are some of our gardens and museums and galleries who are currently still three weeks on, five weeks on, experiencing a 40% no-show rate from their members who are booking the slots but not actually turning up. In contrast, with only a five, six percent no-show rate from people who've actually bought tickets and who don't come at the last minute, and that's purely down to weather. So we're seeing a real difference in consumer behavior if you're a member of an attraction or if you're a paying visitor to an attraction. Uh, third thing we're experiencing, massive retail sales. I mean, unprecedented. Some of our visitor attractions are reporting their best ever 
I mean, record sales in their shops uh, and retail outlets. And some of these shops and retail outlets could be literally a trestle table with a contactless payment system out on a lawn, but people haven't been able to spend physically for three and a half, four months, and therefore are going kind of crazy when they get to somewhere and want a souvenir of Liberation Day, their first liberation visit. Uh, so that's another one. Um, and then lastly, uh, I suppose just for, for the uh, um, sake of brevity, um, one of the things as a result of people going online to visit visitor attractions, I've been doing a lot of media work here in the UK on discussion programs and, and things like that about mm -hmm. encouraging people to draw up a wish list of places that they can go to once they can. And it may be places that they love, that are familiar with, they haven't been to since they were kids, or they've never been at all, and this is a good opportunity. And so one of the things that we're seeing is that visitor attractions here in the UK are opening up to people who are different from that that they closed to in early March. And I think that's amazing, because we always talk about getting different audience segments, different demographics coming across our doors. And, and this is almost um, in a default way, in an unplanned way, prompted that in a way that some other activities and initiatives have, have not really realized. So that's a quick skate through of what we're, what we're seeing about three, four, five weeks in. I, I mean, that was brilliant. Um, to let everybody know, we don't, when we have panelists on, we don't actually really prepare. We just kind of off the cuff, just ask questions. And um, I have so much that I want to engage with you on because what you mentioned is um, so topical. Janelle is here mentioning, for instance, the no-show rate. And I want to show, this is the Detroit Zoo is one of our partners and friends. Um, you know, this is their website. When you make a reservation, yeah. uh, they're letting you know right up front please commit to the day uh, that you are going. And the Cincinnati Zoo is sending out reminders saying, are you, are you coming today or tomorrow? You know, we, we know that um, people are getting caught up and it's, it, you don't want to blame the members for booking the spot. They're so excited to go. Uh, and they just want to let you, you know, they just, we, you got to make sure that you give your, your guests an opportunity that they can let you know if they can't make it. So reminders are helpful. Um, open up some capacity because the goal is to bring as, as many people as possible uh, to your attraction. Um, so, yeah, Matthew, go ahead. I was just going to add on to that, Randy. I think, yeah, the communication is the key, right? Like, I, I, I think what, what um, you know, let, let's take dinner reservations, right? A lot of folks have made dinner reservations in the past, and there's, in, in, in some situations, there's no penalty if you don't show up, and there's not really, you're not, you're not feeling the impact that you might have on that restaurant. And maybe that restaurant's been doing that for, you know, the last five years, and so they know what their no-show rate would be. I think at this point, it's really important for us to communicate to our, our, our constituents of, you know, what this means to us and, and what the, if they hold a spot, which we want them there, um, what does that mean? It means, well, we won't sell a ticket and we won't let another person in um, and helping them to understand the impact of their, their, um, their actions while maybe we get some time to learn about this um, and, and maybe get, get the, the speed up to know what the no-show rate should be. Um, or, you know, I think in some situations, you know, I, there's uh, another attraction that, that used to allow dinner reservations. And so um, in order to make sure that, you know, I could have dinner wherever I potentially wanted, I would book four of them all at the same time um, because I didn't know where I really would be. Uh, unfortunately, in, in order to control that, they really had to put in a, a consequence, right? I had to, um, to pay if I didn't show up for that. So I don't know that we'll have to get to that, but I think if, if we can in the communication, get on in front of it and make sure folks understand what this truly means and how it's going to impact the attraction they love, I think that we could, we could help to, to influence the behavior. Yeah, and, and to, to kind of continue the conversation, the Q&A is really uh, active specifically around like the no-show behavior. So Randy uh, from the Detroit Zoo, she says that uh, the, that little call out, that little prompt has really helped them. Uh, Jared from the Cincinnati Zoo is mentioning that um, it's really based on weather. The members are more apt to come if it's really hot. So right now we, it's very hot in, in the South and in parts of the Midwest here in the US. So um, 
Uh, on a day when it's exceedingly hot, they're seeing 30% no-shows for the members. On a regular, more moderately weather day, it's 15%. So really yeah. good information in the chat window there. And Richard, uh, from the Clark Planetarium, I want to thank you for sharing. I mean, it, it's interesting to see, hey, you're not experiencing that, right? Um, you're only seeing maybe a 0 to 5% no-show rate, despite the fact that you had some concerns about um, having a $0 ticket. So I think it's it, what's what's key there, Richard, is that you're watching the number, right? And you're, you're making sure that you understand if it is an issue. Um, so it, it's great that it's proven not to be. Um, just make sure we keep a pulse on that and then, then take the appropriate steps if it, if it becomes challenging. Um, as you guys know, not everybody um, that's in our audience today is uses the gateway ticketing software. But if you, if you do, and you need some help, there's reports that we could help you with. We can help, you know, really what you need to do, exactly what Matthew said, know who's coming and uh, look at their membership information, compare it to their visitation, right? You can create some nice views and reports that will help you see, did this person come or what's their propensity for not coming? And then maybe even send them a, a very friendly reminder. Hey, we missed you yesterday. We were expecting you, you know, and let us know next time if you can't come. Those types of communications will go a long way. Um, I'm going to jump to a different slide. I, Bernard, you, you brought something up, but I, you talked about those souvenir items. I absolutely love this. This is what uh, start, you start to see on the shelves at, at Disney World. Uh, this, this together again, you know, call to action. You know, obviously, uh, we saw these at SeaWorld as well. Um, some, some special um, COVID-related offerings. So if you haven't opened yet, retail items are significant. You know, we are seeing some good spend in retail items. Make it uh, unique, make it relative to the experience that you're, you're championing. I like these masks. Uh, my, my kids will all tell you they would love to be Gryffindors, although I think some of them are Slytherin. Uh, but you can get your masks uh, over there. And uh, it's hard to see, but Matthew, this is that iconic, you know, if you guys don't know, Matthew used to work at Universal Studios. Um, but this is that iconic Universal Studios logo. I, I love that one. Oh, yeah, they, they just celebrated their 30th anniversary, unfortunately, while they were closed during the pandemic. And so it's, it's exciting that they brought that logo back and, and included it on the face masks. Hey, um, while I'm on the slide, I, I actually want to show this. Um, just little changes that are important. These are those iconic Disney, uh, you know, uh, trash cans. Um, but they've, they've either removed the flaps or pinned them up. It's just a small little thing to notice that the trash cans, you might need to change your trash cans. Um, that's just something to consider um, because no one wants to touch a trash can. Um, so that's cool. I, I, Lovey was on earlier. I think she had to leave, but uh, I do want to talk about some other cool retail items. So I'm, I'm pivoting. I apologize, everybody. Um, the, the Mob Museum in Las Vegas, this is great. If you haven't been, they have an underground. And in the underground, they have a speakeasy and a distillery. And they've converted their distillery from the moonshine that they normally make to special hand sanitizer. And it's great because you can get some custom labels. Um, you can purchase this uh, on their museum store. Um, they can do, you can do donations or handling donation requests. Really cool uh, retail item. I mean, even just as a straight novelty, I'm, I, there's no way I can buy that when I show up. I also have some nice souvenir sets. And um, also, this is not many places have done this. They put together an entire COVID um, safety bro bro protocol brochure. You can download this PDF directly from their website and um, see what, what everything it is that they're, they're offering uh, in terms of safety for the guest experience. So really uh, a job well done there at the Mob Museum. Man, where do we pivot to now, uh, Matthew? Uh, yeah. Let's, you want to talk about um, heroes a little bit? Yeah, let's talk about staff here. I'll, I'll, I'll... Yeah. So um, one of the uh, uh, discussions I got to sit in last week was um, from the University of Central Florida. And um, they have the uh, Dick Pope Senior Institute for Tourism Studies, where they were doing some uh, research and, and sharing that out to the community. Um, they'll, they'll be, we'll, we'll share some links to uh, their information after this. I, I'd encourage you to, to check out some of the work they're doing. It's, it's very exciting, and, and they're open to, uh, to working with others as well to help with some research projects. But um, 
as many have seen in, in the media as well as just, uh, you know, personally in our involvement and in our reliance on frontline workers at maybe grocery stores or restaurants, uh, their, their, their study found that there's a, a new level of appreciation that, that has developed for, um, you know, those in the service industry. Um, and that there's you know many pieces of term terminology that focus on the heroic efforts of uh, the individuals during this time. Um, obviously, it, with with roles like healthcare, we've seen this level of attention before and attribution in the in the past. Um, but I think this is really the first time that we have seen that in um, the industry in the, the service industry to this level. Uh, and Randy, if you want to go to the next slide, you know. It, I think that we have to appreciate that our attraction employees as well are beginning to demonstrate, you know, heroic levels of, of dedication um, as well when, when they started to return to work, despite, you know, not being in, in the environment that they were right before this happened, right? You know, a, in an area that was free from um, risk uh, and things like that. So um, all that being said, and, and Randy, if you want to go to the next slide, the, the, one of the things that, that, um, uh, they um, had found during their research of kind of just, you know, media um, and that was out there uh, was, uh, you know, a couple key elements. One of those being uh, that there's a time now where what a worker thinks about um, themselves is aligning much closer to what society thinks. Um, and so, you know, both workers and society are both understanding the physical dangers that exist in the role. Um, and workers are, are really proud of the role that they play, and, and they have been, you know, historically, but now society is lauding that, that the values of that work and, and realizing the importance of it. Um, and so, you know, I think when we look at, well, what does this mean um, and, and what the, the, the folks at uh, the University of Central Florida shared was the result of this dynamic shift um, can include an increased focus on pay and benefits. Uh, to be commiserate with the value that workers put on that role and, and what society is acknowledging. Now, uh, one of the things they also shared that I think is important to point out is that the fluidity of the situation um, also has a degree of impact on uh, these perceptions. So with an increased level of risk due to rising cases, um, these feelings will grow, while other so social issues like policing and racial discrimination um, could, could uh, overshadow them. So one of the things that I take from a learning on this is, is focusing on the communication um, as well as recognition and making sure that we're recognizing our, our staff for the work that they're doing. But Randy, I, I wanted to, to ask you as well, and, and I'm going to pause for a second while I uh, get a new battery, um, but to get your thoughts on this as well. But you may be muted, Randy. Yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm muted there. Um, I, I have to stay muted because you never know what you're going to hear uh, in the background of my house. Um, no, I think this is a, a huge change, right? Um, you know, we're start, there, we mentioned this a, a few weeks ago about the, the workforce in California. Um, there's a union workforce that's in the attraction industry. Um, you know, they're, they're under a lot of, you know, they want to reopen and they want to reopen safely. And I, I do feel that there's a real shift in when I've, when I've been reading and, and researching uh, what is happening as attractions reopening uh, are reopening, you definitely can see that the real heroes are those frontline staff that are, are that are there and they're in a maybe a position of vulnerability as they reopen. Everything that Bernard said is absolutely true. They want to be there in this industry. We, we all love what we do. Everybody wants to go back to work. I want to travel. I want to visit all of our customers. Uh, those that work at the at gateway, they want to go to the headquarters and they want to work alongside their teammates. Um, so we know that being a frontline employee is a choice that we make. And sometimes it can be more of an undervalued uh, position where we don't really know, you know, all those those things that those frontline staff go through. But I, I think I wanted to say that are really interesting. Is I, was, I think it was a zoo and we were discussing how through the pandemic, they had to let go of some of their frontline staff. And we're really starting to see a true appreciation for what our frontline team members go through on a day-to-day -day basis, because now we have C-level employees, directors, um, people that traditionally would not be working in parking or at ticket booths um, or uh, accepting tickets. 
they're, they're working in areas they haven't typically worked at or they haven't worked at in a long time. And I think it's, it's a really, it's a meeting of, of, of those two types of positions. And I, I really believe that um, the sunset of this, that on the horizon is gonna be some really great changes for our critical frontline working staff, um, really because of the better understanding of, of what they're doing. Um, I, practically terms, um, I'm sure all of us have ordered pizza during the pandemic. I, I get it delivered. And that, that gentleman has to go and visit all these different houses all the time. And he's probably working more than he ever has right now. And um, I show my appreciation by thanking them, obviously, but I've been tipping them much better than I used to um, because I do, I highly value those, those critical people that are working in those um, service halls or the grocery store or whatnot. Um, so I, I think it's, it's, it's definitely a big change and a shift. Yeah, I, one of the things also I, I was looking at was saying, you know, how do we take and make, you know, every day now employee appreciation day, right? Um, because uh, it, we have we have this workforce that, that's been through an awful lot um, that we're highly reliant on and, and we've just piled on a, a bunch of new responsibilities as uh, Bernard mentioned earlier. Um, and so let's let's not lose sight of that, and let's make sure that that in the ways that we can recognize the value that they're providing, that that we do. Um, that may not be feasible to do through pay changes or or things like that, given everything else that that's going on. Um, but we do we do demonstrate that and and make sure that they feel valued. Um, Randy, the other the 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 study that you have up on screen right now, um, this was another um, uh, kind of study that that the um, University of Central Florida had done, um, and this was where basically they, they took the opportunity to um, uh, engage with folks that were affected um, when the pandemic started. So obviously a lot of attractions shuttered, um, a lot of service industry, industry folks were either furloughed or, or out of work. Um, and what they did is, is did a study at that time to kind of learn from, from that experience so that in the future, you know, that we could we could uh, perform better. Um, and, and here again, there were a couple of key findings that one, despite the unfortunate effect of the pandemic on the industry um, and the trickle down effect that that had on the workforce, people, you know, wanted to stay in the industry. They, they weren't being scared away from the industry as being unstable, um, nor were they being scared away from returning to work with their current employer. Um, while many in the workforce felt that their employer was supportive, there was a chunk of folks um, that, that didn't see that support. Um, and one area that overall did well was communication and fairness. However, again, there was a portion of the population that felt that that, that had some, some room for improvement. So, you know, one of the things that the researchers shared as, as those key takeaways was, one is, is communication is the key. And I think that really is held true through you know, the majority of what we've talked about here today and I, I think in the past, um, you know, in, in this situation, uh, I think folks were, were very understanding that maybe the attractions don't know what's going on or, or can't, you know, haven't made a decision yet or uh, are unsure when they're going to be able to open. But I think being transparent with that um, is, is critical to our, our workforce. Um, and transparency has been critical in other situations, like what Randy had shown from the Mob Museum. Here, here's my policies and procedures. Here's everything that I'm doing. I'm going to be as transparent as possible because I understand that we're all in an unstable and a confusing time, and, and we want to provide that, um, that visibility. One of the things that I also found in this study was that it's important to emphasize the organizational resilience. Um, in that, you know, there's a commitment that the, you know, as, as much as possible, we're, we're coming back and, and we want to, um, uh, to be part of this community continuing. Um, and then focusing on methods to help employees cope with stress. Uh, I think this one, uh, so for those of you that know me, I'm, I'm a very analytical person. I, I get, you know, dinged a little bit because I may not be as social um, as, as I should be. Um, and so this one at first was a little bit challenging for me to understand. But I, when I look at, at what our attractions and, and an employer provides, it's, it's generally um, the, my ability to be um, uh, live the life I want to live, right? They're, they're providing my, me that income. They're, they're, they're such a key part of that. Um, and, and 
whenever I get into this um, situation where everything is thrown up in the air and, and, and I don't know what's going to happen next and, and there's so much confusion around me, um, it, it, it kind of makes sense in that, you know, I might be looking to, to something that has been solid in my life in the past for help. Um, and, and while we're not, you know, obviously licensed um, uh, psychiatrists or, or folks that, that maybe are, are intended to provide that, um, if we have programs like an employee assistance program, I think that that's a vital time for it. Um, but I think it's, it's, it may just come into having the sensitivity to understand that folks are under a, an immense amount of stress. And, and how do I make sure that my interactions with them and, and the way that I'm going to maybe deliver the message or, or have a conversation um, is sensitive to that? Uh, so, so I think that was one of the things, you know, while, while the, the, the study was showing that folks need to help dealing with that stress, I think part of that is by causing more stress or introducing um, more complexities by the way that you may deliver something. So if you want to stay tuned to this, um, one of the things they shared is that they're going to be doing a longitudinal, a longitudinal research um, with the same group so that they can understand as we move into recovery, how is this group affected? What can we continue to learn from it? Um, so I, I, would, um, I, would bring that, uh, I would focus on that. Uh, Bernard, I, I was wondering if, if you had any specific thoughts when it when it relates to communication. Like, what are you seeing as important for attractions when they're communicating in in the public or or even with their workforce? Um, uh, two things, really. The first is um, for those who for those members of staff who haven't been working, who've been put on job retention scheme or whatever, so that they've been paid but 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 can't work. We've seen one particular phenomena, whereas um, some group of, of staff have come back to reopen the visitor attraction. They've been caught up with the adrenaline and the excitement and the craziness and the buzz. And there's a group of staff who are still working at home or not working. Uh, and they haven't been able to participate in all of that. And, and so one of the great anxieties is the potential creation of two cultures within an organization. So being really mindful about the fact that some of your staff may be in the adrenaline, the bars, the excitement, and some of your staff would love to be, but can't, can't participate in all of that because of where they are within the organization. So one, be mindful of that. Um, second, in, in terms of transparency, um, <laughs> one of the things, uh, and I suspect it may be the same in the US as it is here in the UK, uh, there was a, a survey done fairly recently, and it was about uh, perceptions of truth and trust. And uh, politicians have plummeted, and museums and galleries have gone up. And, and that's partly because museums and galleries deal with fact and data and evidence and archaeological research and history and study and academia. And you know, this whole notion of uh, false news and untruths, um, it's made the way, particularly here in the UK, and I know certainly in the, the US, about the, the untold stories of people, and particularly the phenomena of Black Lives Matter, um, has, has had a real impact here in the UK. So uh, transparency and authentic storytelling and being truthful uh, has has suddenly had more kudos, more weight, more gravitas, if you like. Um, and I suppose the third, and in comparison to the last two points, this may feel somewhat flippant. Um, one of the greatest communication tools that we've seen by far of visitor attractions is visitor attractions uh, undertaking videos of what the customer experience is like and then putting it on their website. And this need only be done by a phone, certainly not by a, a film crew or anything. So as cheap as possible, and actually the less expensive, the more authentic it looks. So um, nearly all of our members have invested in someone uh, with their iPhone going from the car park towards the front desk. How do you show your ticket is a barcode? Who are you going to see when you arrive there? Will they be wearing personal protection equipment or, or will they be wearing a face visor? What are the physical distancing signs on the floor? How do I get to the toilet? What does that look like? Do I do a grab and go for food and drink or do I, am I able to sit down? It, it's a real sort of, you know, three minute 
uh, compacted journey of what your experience is going to be. And here in the UK, where visitor attractions have got that on their website, the typical number who, uh, who have downloaded and viewed it has been 97% of visitors. It's been absolutely phenomenal. People just want to experience in advance what they're going to experience when they turn up. And it's been the most reassuring tool for people. So three very different examples, forgive me, um, but, but speak to very, very different needs on the part of either workers or visitors. Uh, I, I'm, a lot of what you said totally resonated uh, with me, and I, I thought about the anxiety of, of coming back to work for people that are, are been away from work. And, it, and if you're a manufacturer and supplier like Gateway Ticketing it is, we go through the same thing. We have a workforce that traditionally works from home or works away from the office, and now everybody's in that work from home. And it, it, I'm imagining it's, it, it takes a little bit as, as these employees reunite and they kind of get back into their paces of gelling. Um, something that you said at the very end that was really interesting. I love watching the vlogs. I've been, I'm, I, I've been watching the reopenings of almost every park. And a lot of my other slides we haven't gotten to actually showcase some of that. And I, as we have always said, it's very important to showcase what the experience looks like, your masks. And, and something that was something amazing happened. My kid was playing a video game on their iPad. And, and I started to realize that there's this social conditioning of what the new normal is. It transcends, it transcends attractions. It's everywhere. It's like my kids, I, Bill was telling me, he's on the online, like he went somewhere, you know, your kids are being trained, like it's time for hand sanitizer, time for hand sanitizer before, it's time for hand sanitizer after. But this is a game that my kid plays. And I, I, this is the craziest thing. The video game has social distancing markers in that in the game. I like the kids are so my, my kid knows exactly what this. This is a crazy game. The game is uh, shamefully it's called Dumb Ways to Die, and my kid absolutely shouldn't be playing it, but they are. Um, but um, you know we're starting to see even how games are are taking uh, you know social distancing and physical distancing and, and incorporating them, and it's a good tool because. When we are going somewhere, we want to know what what to expect. Yeah, I think it's just those gentle reminders. It's the it's that subconsciously helping folks to understand and set the expectations of what we're doing. So when I go to that, you know, the Boston Children Museum website and I see those masks, that that's helping me to remember. That's that's what I'm going to be expected to, even though that may be not the the um, you know sizzle photo that 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 we're wanting to to put out. Yeah, and I actually saw the shift in the UK, wherein Originally, upon reopening, a lot of the messaging was maybe a little bit more. We're wearing masks, and sometimes now it's a little different message. Like, hey, it's you know everything's got to be pre-booked, um, but we're certainly letting people know. One thing that struck me at Paulton's Park is that um, they they have a reservation system, and they're clearly outlining when you need reservations, how popular the day is going to be. But you can also search on their on their website, and they've got a great video of of just simply how to use their app. It's something that we probably wouldn't have seen in the past, but they're talking about how to use their virtual queuing app. But they're also highlighting that they're not using it every day. They're only gonna use it on select days uh, when they need to. Because what we're seeing is uh, a big adjustment, and this is a big surprise I would say, is that a lot of places are actually turning reservations off. They're not seeing the demand that they were hoping to have uh, their numbers are less than the capacity threshold that they've set. Um, and in particular, virtual queuing, which is a great tool. Um, they've got a virtual queuing too. That they just don't have to use it all the time. Um, one thing I do like I'd note about this one is that um, there's some really great virtual queuing tools that are out there. I don't know if Paulton's built their own, but I do like how it's for your whole party. You don't have to have a ticket per person. It just really has the feel, um, I think someone had said earlier about like making a reservation at a restaurant. It's kind of like that. You're just saying, I'm here, there's eight of us. Um, I wanna go when, I, when I'm ready. You let me know when I'm able to go. And then of course you're, you get alerted or you get a time to come back. Um, so for the places that maybe need virtual queuing, I've seen some really cool solutions um, out there um, that, they're in, that they're using. Um, about reservations, 
Um, Matthew, this is something else that you mentioned. Yeah, so in the U.S., we've now seen a, a lot of changes when it comes to uh, reservations and, and the reopening requirement that folks were going to have to have reservations. One of those is like park chains like Cedar Fair um, that have recently removed the requirement. Uh, Dollywood encourages reservations but doesn't require them. Um, and Hershey Park has recently removed the requirement from season pass holders. And, you know, we also saw back when, when Universal Orlando opened its three parks that they never implemented a reservation requirement, uh, despite having a commitment to limiting attendance to appropriate levels to maintain physical distancing. So one of the things when I started to, to see some of this, it, it kind of made me wonder, well, what does this mean for attractions that maybe are doing reservations, we're planning doing reservations? And it leads me to believe that, that right now what we're seeing is that the demand for attractions is still soft. Um, coming out of the initial months of the pandemic, and that despite our attractions operating at a limited capacity, we're still able to accommodate that demand without having these rigid metering um, methods in place like reservations. Um, this may be a difference of, you know, whether or not this is considered a V-shape attendance recovery or more of a U-shape um, recovery. Uh, but for attractions that are, are wondering what this might mean for their current or planned reservation systems, um, I, I think that, that this means that we're probably still going through, that we may still have a need for them. Um, it's just, it's not necessarily right when we reopen because the demand is soft. So uh, I think that in the long run, we probably are, are still going to have these uh, types of mechanisms are going to play a role um, because we're probably going to get to a point where the uh, general feeling about uh, the pandemic has improved, which has more folks wanting to get out. Um, but we may still be holding our attractions at a lower level of capacity so that we ensure the physical distancing. Now, um, it, when that occurs, we might see some of these reservation requirements come back, um, or it may be opportunities for attractions to employ other mechanisms to help control that demand. For example, like maybe demand-based pricing that could help to move the visitation to where um, there's more capacity while not necessarily needing to turn anybody away on a, on a given day. Yeah, and we're starting to see that to bring up the Detroit Zoo again. They've just turned on their demand-based pricing um, uh, to try to encourage, you know, remember dynamic pricing demand, it's all about, you know, uh, you know, peaks and valleys, right? You want to raise the valleys, lower the peaks, have a good consistent flow. Of course, everybody right now wants to bring as many people in as possible, but um, definitely look at dynamic pricing. I, I would expect a real big trend for 2021 would be dynamic pricing. Um, so, and that's a way to think differently. Like, like Bernard said, this is the time to think differently. Um, we only have a few more minutes, but I, I, I want to showcase some of my uh, other uh, really favorites. I'm a native of Southern Cal, Knott's Berry Farm is very near and dear. And this is a great opportunity to think differently. Knott's Berry Farm, its roots were an open park. You could walk in and you would pay for attractions as you go. Um, they have a new, um, a new offering called Taste of Calico. So you can go into the, the Calico area and you can see all the old buildings. It's, it's very open and spacious. And they're just bringing a, a, a food and beverage festival that they're calling Taste of Calico. Um, you have to buy tastings in advance. It's $25 per person, um, and you can get either five or three tastings. And they were only going to do this in July, um, and I think that was because they were expecting to open. And, and it also could be that they were expecting to open, and they started to do their food ordering. And how, what do you do with all your food when you can't open because of new regulation in California? So um, really great ideas. Think differently. Um, our friends up at the Santa Cruz uh, Beach Boardwalk, um, they're known for food. Um, the, the, the attractions aren't open, but most of the food outlets are. Um, Ken Whiting from Whiting, uh, Whiting Foods, he runs a lot of the food establishments, but um, you can still go stroll the boardwalk, um, maintaining social distancing, um, but you can still get some, some food. So there are some really, really cool um, opportunities out there to still get some profitability and some revenue. Um, as you are experiencing a phased reopening. Um, yeah. 
I mean, obviously, California has been impacted a little bit more on, on the ability to reopen given what's going on there. So I, I really applaud these two attractions, and I'm sure others, of looking at the situation and saying, what is, what is it that, that we can't do? What is safe that we can do um, that allows us to, to take steps forward um, versus having to stand still or go back? And I think, you know, being outdoors, totally great um, situation. Encouraging safe behavior um, and then providing food are, I think, all ways that, that we are, they were able to check those boxes and really deliver something great. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, I'm looking at a, 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 the time here, and I'm going to do some closing announcements. Um, I want to point some people in the right direction for some resources. IAPA just released uh, um, sometime around the time that, Matthew, you got your haircut. By the way, I noticed that you, you, you trimmed up there a little bit. Uh, it looks like IAPA came out with a new reopening guidance. We will send you an email with this information. Uh, it's a great resource to read through on updated recommendations. That's their, their second uh, edition of that. Um, we understand if you're part of our Gateway family that you're starting to rapidly reopen. You might have different um, uh, persons available. Um, we've updated at Gateway our learning solutions tool. Um, if you are rapidly rehiring and your training team is um, actively working in other areas of your attraction, let us know. We can help you out with that. We understand that there's a need to maybe quickly train staff, and um, we have some tools that are electronic tools that um, you can um, leverage at your attraction. Um, as always, we're, we're here for you guys. Everyone in the community, we're here for you. Like um, Bernard mentioned, um, these weekly webinars that Alva and Gateway UK are putting on in the UK. Um, if you want more information about those, uh, I'll get some information from Bernard on how to maybe join in if you're from the UK and you're not attending. Um, if you're in the US, join us um, with our Tuesday talks, uh, our, our webinar series. If you are not getting information and you just stumbled upon us today, uh, email us at marketingatgatewayticketing.com. Our next webinar will be August 5th, uh, same time, right here, two weeks from today. Uh, we're really excited. We're planning on um, really kind of looking at everything from a guest perspective. So we're, we're looking at getting some, some, uh, some fan sites and some, some, some uh, guests that visit many attractions to share their stories, um, a reopening from their footsteps. So it will be hopefully a really great webinar if you're interested in attending or helping out, let us know. Oh, on behalf of all, Bernard, you, you're amazing. Thank you, thank you so much. You are a wealth of knowledge and insight. Um, thank you for sharing your evening with us. Um, um, I, I appreciate it uh, immensely. It's, it's pretty late for you, although, yes, cheers to you. It's, it's fine time, frankly. <laughs> that, I, I'm, we're going to have a happy hour right after this, I'm sure, on our end, too. So um, I appreciate you very much for joining us today. Pleasure. Thank you. Um, Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Bill and Greg, behind the scenes. And thank you all for your great chats. Bye, everybody. Take care, y'all.